Hi, in this session, I'd like to talk about interest rates. Now, if you think about it, we're surrounded by interest rates, right? But an interest rate is the rate that you pay if you're a borrower of money and a rate you receive if you lend money out. But when you look around you, these are the rates you see. You see fixed deposits rates when you go into a bank and think about depositing your money in a CD. You see mortgage rates when you go out to borrow money to buy a house. You see rates you can earn on, on money market funds when you invest in a, through a brokerage account. Or rates you pay on your credit card if you fail to make your entire credit card due payment on the date that it's due. So we're surrounded by rates. And it's easy to get confused about where these rates come from, why they're different, why they move in different directions. Broadly speaking, if you look at how interest rates are set, you can put them into four groups. The first are market set rates or market determined rates set by demand and supply. The rate you earn on commercial paper or a T-bill or a T-bond is a market set rate. The second are market influence rates. These are rates that somebody sets, but they set it based upon a market based rate. For instance, the rate you see on fixed deposits or your mortgage rate might not be set by a market directly, but they are influenced by what's happening in the treasury market in terms of treasury rates going up or down. Some rates are set by entities, by banks, by central banks, by credit card companies. They tend to be a little more rigid. It's not quite clear what they're based on. So indirectly, even they might be affected by what those market determined rates are. And finally, if you're negotiating with somebody to take a loan, the rate you come up with is a negotiated rate. That rate too is affected by market-based rates. In other words, market-determined rates are the foundation for all of the interest rates you see. Whether they show up immediately or over time depends on how flexible the rate you're looking at is and how often it's reset. So let's take the most visible of these market-determined rates, which is the rate on a U.S. Treasury. And U.S. Treasuries, of course, are bonds issued by the U.S. government. They can be short term, they can be long term. Here I've looked at the rates on a three month table, which is towards the very end, the lowest end of the maturity spectrum, shortest term, and 10 year T bonds, which is the most widely traded of the US Treasury bonds. Now, of course, there are 30 year bonds and 20 year bonds, so I'm going to focus on the 10 year bond and the three month table in this graph. I've graphed out what these numbers have looked like since 1928. And you can see the T-bill rate and the T-bond rate generally move together. When one goes up, the other goes up, and one goes down, the other goes down. There are periods where the two seem to move in different directions. We'll come back and talk about it because that is what drives what's called the yield curve. So you've got short-term rates and long-term rates. Over the last 15 years, in addition to these rates, and these rates, incidentally, are nominal rates. What does that mean? You invest in dollars, you receive the money in dollars, and to the extent that there's inflation, it's eat, it eats away to returns. Now, for the last 15 years, you had another, another choice to make in the treasury market. You can invest in an inflation-protected T-bond. It's called a TIPS. And here's how it works. Instead of guaranteeing you a nominal rate of return, so when you buy a 10-year T-bond, for instance, you're given a 3% coupon. The coupon is fixed. It's guaranteed. With a TIPS, you're not guaranteed a fixed rate of return. You're guaranteed a real interest rate of 1%. And to the extent that there's inflation, that inflation gets added on. That way, you're guaranteed the 1% return. What does that mean? If inflation is only 2%, you'll make a 3% return. If inflation jumps to 10%, you'll make 11% return. So a tips rate is a real interest rate. Now, this is as good a time as any to introduce one of my favorite equations that helps me understand interest rates. I'm a simplest, a sim, uh, I am simplistic, and this does help. It's called the Fisher equation. The Fisher equation is just a breakdown of a nominal interest rate into what? A real interest rate and expected inflation. So when you have a 5% nominal rate, the Fisher equation says some of that is for expected inflation, some of it is a real interest rate. Now, real interest rates are a function of how much we prefer current consumption. So we invest as investors collectively prefer current consumption more, the real interest rate will go up. But over time, the real interest rate is also tied to real growth. When growth has been high, real interest rates have tended to be high. When growth is low, real interest rates are low. I'll tell you why I like the Fisher equation. The Fisher equation helps me understand why rates change over time, why they're high at some times and low at others, and why they might even become negative. If inflation is high and real growth is strong, you should expect to see the normal interest rate be high. 
if you have deflation in some, some economies, some currencies you do, and real growth is very low or even negative, oh, you can have negative interest rates. That's an easy answer to the question. Can rates become negative? Yes, it's unusual, but it's not unnatural. Now let's see how well the Fisher equation works. For the last few years, I've been computing what's called an intrinsic risk-free rate. You're saying, what the heck is an intrinsic risk-free rate? Every year, I track two numbers. I track the inflation rate that year and the real GDP growth that year. Remember I said in the long term, real growth and real interest rates converge. I'm going to take a simplistic view. Let's assume the real growth in any year is the real interest rate in that year. I add the inflation rate to the real growth rate. So I'll take an example. You know, inflation rate you know, five, six years ago was 2%. The real growth rate was 1.5%. 2 plus 1.5% is 3.5%. I call that my intrinsic risk free rate. See the black line? That is my intrinsic risk free rate computed by adding together. The, I'm sorry, the, the, see the columns, the gray column plus the blue? Those numbers put together is my intrinsic risk free rate. The black line is the smoothed out version of that. You're saying smoothed out for what? Inflation tends to jump around. I use average growth and average inflation. So it's a much better measure of that intrinsic risk free rate because it smooths out year to year differences. Take a look at the black line and the red line. The black line is what the rate should have been given inflation and real growth smoothed out. The red line is what it actually was. Hey, do the two move together? In my, at least in my eyes, they certainly do. In fact, if you look at the breakdown of intrinsic risk-free rates and T-bond rates by decade, you can see over the decades how the two have been tied together. So as you go through time, you see that if, when inflation is high and growth is high, 70s for instance, interest rates are high. And it also answers the question, why have rates been low over the last decade? Hey, don't be so quick. I know you're going to say it because the Fed willed it to be so. The Fed has had an effect. But rates have been low for the last decade for a simpler reason. Inflation has been low and real growth has been anemic. Low inflation plus low growth gives you low rates. The so Fed had an effect, as we'll see in a minute, has, but the real driver of interest rates over time is inflation and real growth. So now let's talk about central banks. If you listen to CNBC, if you read what financial gurus think about the market, you would think central banks set rates. That is the perception that's often given. Why are rates low? Because the Fed lowered rates. Well, there's a very simple response to that. The Fed does not set rates. It doesn't set the T-bill rate. It doesn't set the T-bond rate. It doesn't even set your mortgage rate. The Fed actually drives only one rate, and it's not even a very widely used rate. It's called the Fed funds rate. It's a rate at which commercial banks can borrow and lend to each other on an intraday basis. It's a really short-term rate that only banks can use. Am I saying the Fed has no power to set rates? Of course not. When the Fed changes the Fed funds rate, it's sending a signal to the market. And to the extent that the Fed is viewed as this all-powerful entity, the power of that signal is directly correlated with how much power investors think the Fed has. I know I'm talking in circles, but I've described the Fed as the Wizard of Oz. Remember the Wizard of Oz? The power of the wizard came from the perception that the wizard had power. The wizard really had no power, but that perception was enough. Central banks get their power from the perception that they have power. In fact, to isolate what the Fed has had, uh, the effect the Fed has had, here's what I did. See these blue columns? That's the difference between the 10-year T-bond rate and the intrinsic risk-free rate over time. I've grafted it out against the Fed, the Fed. Basically, I've grafted it out against the Fed funds rate over this period. And you can see as you look at the Fed funds rate, the Fed funds rate has been low, but the effect of the Fed funds rate on on overall rates has been fairly small. It's not it's not zero, obviously, but the effect has been small. So when people talk about the Fed setting interest rates, one of the questions you might want to ask them is what rate does the Fed set? Central banks are power, but the perception of power is what gives them that power. Now, of course, over the last, tw <clears throat> last 12 years, central banks have become much more activist in the interest rate market. In fact, after the 2008 crisis, Fed, the Fed in particular, but central banks across the world, started on a process called quantitative easing. It's just a fancy word for the Fed was actually buying bonds in the treasury market. And remember, when you have a large player buying bonds in the treasury market, rates are going to go down. 
It's had an effect on rates. Quantitative easing has lowered rates because the Fed has been buying bonds. But if you track how much the Fed has actually spent buying those bonds over time, the effect is small and it's up early. So even after they stopped buying bonds, the rates stayed low. So as we, as, while critics might attribute everything that happens to interest rates to central banks, the reality actually is different. Central banks influence rates, they don't set them. One final point about interest rates before we move on. When you looked at the three-month table rate and the 10-year bond rate, you noticed that they moved together most of the time, but sometimes moved in different directions. In fact, the yield curve measures rates at different maturities. And generally speaking, yield curve can take one of three forms. So basically, yield curve, you plot rates for three months, one year, two year, five year, 10 year on the same graph. Yield curves can be take one of three forms. One is they can be upward sloping, where long-term rates are higher than short-term rates. Second, they can be flat, where long-term and short-term rates are pretty similar. And sometimes they can be downward sloping. You think, who cares? In a minute, I'll come to that. But if you look across time, rates most of the time reflect an upward sloping yield curve. Here, for instance, I've taken the entire decade from 2010 through 2018. You see, for the most part, rates slope upwards. In fact, if you look at the last 100 years, the predominant slope for the yield curve has been an upward sloping yield curve. But as I said, once in a while, you get downward sloping yield curves. But before I look at downward sloping yield curves, let's think about why the yield curve might be upward sloping. To the extent that inflation is built into rates, maybe it's because people expect higher inflation in the future. But that would be odd that people always expect higher inflation in the future through the last 100 years. The other is, and this is an argument that was made a long time ago, is maybe investors demand a maturity premium for buying a long-term bond as opposed to a short-term bill. Why? Because if inflation becomes volatile and you're uncertain about the future, maybe you'll demand a premium for buying longer-term uh, longer bonds. Whatever the reason, though, the conventional yield curve is upward sloping. But once in a while, it does get downward sloping and people freak out. Why? Because, take an example, this was the on December 4th of 2018. It wasn't even the entire yield curve. A portion of the yield curve became downward sloping. You can see it, it's between the two-year and the five-year. And people were convinced that the end of the world was coming. Why? Because if you look at downward sloping yield curves over time, there is at least this indirect evidence that downward sloping yield curves seem to preview a decline in the economy, that economic growth is going to drop off, maybe even a recession. So a downward sloping yield curve has been used by many as a signal that the economy is going to go into a slowdown or a recession. And often they back it up with a graph and the graph actually looks very powerful. So basically what you see in this graph is the spread between the two year and the 10 year bond, which is what people have often used as a measure of the yield curve and what happens in terms of the economy. So the grays are all the recession periods. You can already see that quite a few of the recessions that have happened over the last 50 years have been preceded by a downward sloping yield curve. So this seems like a slam dunk, right? Downward sloping yield curve, econ economy is going to go into recession, start selling stocks. Well, before you jump to that conclusion, I think that we need to take a deeper look. Remember, the, before the yield curve becomes downward sloping, it first becomes flat. So maybe rather than throw away all the data and just look at whether the yield curve is upward or downward sloping, we should just look at the difference between three month and one year rates, one year and two year rates, and look to see whether there's a correlation between the differences between those rates and what happens to economic growth. And I did that. In fact, I looked at the, the difference between you know, different maturities, 2 and 10, 2 and 3, 1, 1 and 3. Essentially, I graphed them out over time and real GDP growth every year. And my objective was to see if there was a correlation between how upward sloping the yield curve was and how well the economy does. Remember, the conventional wisdom is the more upward sloping the yield curve, the better the economy does. Well, take a look at this table. What the best way to read the table is to look at the slope of the yield curve and, and look at the correlation between that and real GDP growth in the next quarter and the next year. Remember, if the slope of the yield curve is a very good predictor of GDP growth, upward sloping yield curves and high growth go together, 
this correlation should not just be positive, but it should be a high number. How high? Remember, correlations are capped at one, so it should be a number of point. You know, you make a, you know, you make a, you make your own judgment on what's high: 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. I'll start with the good news. When I looked from 1962 through 2018, the correlation is positive. That's good news because that's at least mildly supportive of the notion that when the yield curve is upward sloping, GDP growth is higher. But it's generally the short end of the spectrum which seems to have the positive correlations even over the entire time period. If you look at the longer term rates, five year versus two year, 10 year versus two year, correlation is negative. Upward sloping yield curves have not been good predictors of GDP growth over the last 56 years or between 1962 and through the 2018. If I focus on the 10 years since the 2008 crisis, things seem to have shifted even more. In fact, the relationship between the yield curve and GDP growth has become almost perverse. Downward sloping yield curves or less upward sloping yield curves seem to be more associated with higher growth than more upward sloping yield curves. What changed? I think the behavior of the Fed changed and it's created some permanent shifts in how the economy reacts to yield curves. Now, I'm not saying there's no information in the slope of the yield curve, but I'm saying be cautious because you will see people throw out rules of thumb based on a very long history and those rules of thumb don't seem to work very well anymore. So let's summarize what we've talked about with interest rates. Interest rates can be market set or market influence. If they're market set, they will move over time. What causes them to move over time? Put simply, changes in expectations about inflation and changes in real interest rates. And if you're trying to explain the movement of a market set rate, like the US Treasury rate over time, go back to inflation and real growth. And central banks, at best, influences those rates. They can't set those rates. Put simply, if inflation was 7% right now, there's nothing central banks can do to keep the rates at 1% or 2%. At the margin, central banks are players in the game. They don't write the rules in the game. So we'll come back and talk more about interest rates in the context of valuation, but it's good to have this foundation laid before we embark on more ambitious pursuits. Thank you.